You're done with your Oreo? <laughs> yeah, I'm done with my Oreo. Okay, good. Um, yeah, do you really know what happened? Yeah. The brother did. The that. brother, that's what I thought too. I mean, that seems like kind of obvious. Do you just want to talk about death? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, this is I mystery, that murdery, murdery, thingy, 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 thingy. Hey. Hey. Long time no hear? Talk? Talk? L- listen? Question? Mark? Hopefully. Are you guys still there? So, we have we're, an issue. We're not dead. We're not dead. We do have an issue, though. I thought my Instagram <laughs> uh, post about our uh, um, Friday announcement, our hiatus, went out, but it didn't. Oh, really? Well, sorry, y'all. No, I feel really bad. I don't like doing that. I like to keep in communication with what know, we're right? doing, and it bothers me that that happened, and I'm really sorry. Wow. Um, but we have changed to every other week. So, yeah, I think we're just going to go with every other week. Yes. That way we can, we can do more research. That's exactly what I wanted to do. Cause I'm, like, I started that book on the condor. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of stuff con- where I'm like, Oh, yeah, this has a book with it. Like I didn't right. know that. Like we were going right. in two days. Like, Oh, this has a fucking book. Oh, and I, also know. we have jobs <laughs> that we have to go to all jobs. day, which is so annoying. Full time. <laughs> Um, I'm very thankful for my job. I am very thankful. By the way, that was, I was joking. This is Mystery Murdery Thingy, by the way. Oh, yes. Welcome to Mystery Murdery Thingy. <laughs> when I was at that, my name is Chloe. My name is Mario. When I was at that work thing today. Did you plug the pod? But they were like, oh, yeah, it's called, like, Murdery Mystery Thingy. <laughs> like, they literally said, both said that at the same time. <laughs> yeah. No, but that's wrong. It's Mystery Murdery Thingy. <laughs> no, when he's like, what's the name? I was like... <laughs> <laughs> let's rename it <laughs> no but it, it like perfectly it describes what we talk about it's we true talk about mystery murdery thingies what is yours this week like mine is a murdery it's a it's a fucking mystery <laughs> murdery thingy it yeah. is a mystery murdery great i think you should go first okay Just i'll go first change it up change it up a little bit yeah i mine's gonna be a little bit short but it did come from that really nice list of unsolved deaths Wikipedia page. Right. Um, there's w- some one I- of our key resources. Key, key resources. Yes. One of the one of the ones I started reading, but I was like, oh wow. And then I was like, oh, you know what? Mario did that one. It was about the guy <laughs> who like died in New Zealand or whatever, or like uh, he couldn't. He like no, he died in like Antarctica, and he like couldn't get airlifted or something yes yeah they, like the, don't really know he right. got really sick and they don't really know why and the episode about the polar mysteries right yes the polar right. mysteries that was right. a good and okay because we've been all over the world all over the world uh, i was gonna do one from nigeria but, but it's it not a mystery. a mystery well i guess there are mystery aspects to it but mm. i don't know but it sometimes was... that happens you know you just like you keep looking into it and it's like oh Oh, somebody did solve it eventually. Yeah, okay. it's called the Ibadan Forest of Horror, Ooh. and it's basically a, a kidnapping <laughs> den. Yeah, yeah, lots of dead bodies. Oh. Um, very nasty, very oh, gruesome. God. But sounds like a literal horror movie. Yeah, Jesus. Anyway, moving on to something else. So I'm going to talk about the death of Gary Devore. Do you know who Gary Devore is? I don't okay. think so. So mine's like a Hollywood mystery. Those are my favorite. The So Gary DeVore was a Hollywood screenwriter, best known for Raw Deal with Arnold Schwarzenegger and Dogs of War with Christopher Walken. I've heard of that one. And uh, so at the time of his death in 1990, 1997, he was working on a new script called The Big Steal. Now, it would be an action thriller movie based on the 1949 heist movie, The Big Steel. And this would be his, his, he was a um, screenwriter and producer. This would be his directing debut. Um, And it was unlike any of the other films that he had ever written, which were usually witty and like um, uh, action, but comedic. Um, And this one was, was an action thriller so it's definitely definitely something different it was going to be very political it um was concerning the u.s invasion of panama and how the cia overthrew their dictator manuel noriega now i'm going to go into it a little bit but that a little bit later um but note that the script was highly critical of the u.s usa's actions in this matter um 
it's def it was definitely if it was if it was put out as a movie it definitely had a very obvious stance in the matter sure so on the night of june 28th 1997 gary had just finished his script for the big steel and he was driving home from santa fe new mexico to santa barbara california and he never made it home Despite an extensive search, oddly enough, his body was found exactly one year later, um, which his wife talks about how that freaks her out, and she didn't like that. Um, he and his car were discovered submerged under a bridge over the California aqueduct in Palmdale, um, California. But what's interesting is that... Uh, I guess reportedly that aqueduct had been searched because there was a, an extensive search, but then a year later, here's his car and his body. Um, it was actually discovered by an accident specialist who was doing some amateur sleuthing. The officials ruled it an accident, but Gary's wife, as well as other friends and family, believe that he was murdered by the U.S. government and that they're trying to cover it up. So let's get into this. The official explanation um so like i said it was deemed a tragic accident and the official report itself was really suspicious his laptop containing the copy of the script was missing his handgun as well as ammunition that he kept with him when he went on long um road trips was missing and so were his hands uh for what? yeah for the official account to check out according to the report if they were to walk through like how they described it happened, Gary would have had to drive two miles against traffic without being seen in the dark, without headlights, um, through the guardrail into the aqueduct. The investigation had determined that they, that the headlights had been deliberately shut off, which I don't know how they can determine that. I, I was kind of confused. Like and someone cut the wire or something. I, I couldn't, huh. I don't know. Curious. Um, and the investigation wasn't that great in the first place. Wendy DeVore, uh, his, his widow, had pushed the investigators to dig deeper, and they eventually found finger bones under the silt uh, that had, um, not grown, gathered uh, towards the back of the car. It was really submerged in there. Mm. Um, unsure if they're his, they really weren't sure, um, because Gary also had a pinky deformity, and that would be like a positive ID that these were belonging to him. The investigators talked about finding over 23 bones, but turns out they only found three. The report also confirmed that there were that the rumors were true. The bones were actually hundreds of years old and never confirmed to be Gary's at all. Hmm. Um Wendy commissioned a second autopsy to be done, but she never saw or heard anything of that report. I've heard of that happening before. That's so strange when families get like these autopsies um, or re-examinations mm -hmm. done, but then somehow they don't ever end up getting the actual report for their money. It's like, it doesn't make any sense. Yeah, it's, there's a lot of questions here. Yeah. Um... Wendy talked about how Gary's research for for writing the script, you know, his research into the Panama invasion really started to affect him. So Wendy told CNN, quote, he had been very disturbed over some of the things that he had been finding in his research. He was researching the United States invasion of Panama because he was setting the actual story that he was writing against this and, and the overthrow of Noriega and the enormous amounts of money laundering in the Panamanian banks, also our own government's money laundering, end quote. Dr. Matthew Alford, who I'll talk about um, a lot through this article, he uh, is a writer of the award-winning documentary and book, The Writer With No Hands. He did, um, I believe it was a decade of research on the case before putting really putting through this documentary in 2017. He found that... Um, okay, Alfred found that Gary had a did indeed have a working relationship with the CIA. Um, he knew Chase Brandon. So Chase Brandon um, was the CIA's first entertainment liaison officer uh, for the entertainment industry working from late 96 to 2007. So turns out the CIA had a very deep 
deep, massive influence on the media and entertainment industry, um, aka Operation Mockingbird, starting in the 50s but being revealed in the late 70s that, you know, basically psychological warfare, this and that and the other thing, it, that's a whole thing that we don't need to get into. Psyops. <laughs> Whenever you're talking CIA long enough, you get to the word psyops. Psyops, yeah. It's kind of what they do. And also kill people. So, sorry, Jesus. just go ahead. So many... We <laughs> so had that many episode. <laughs> from in so many countries. It's thought... Up to and including today. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry. It's sad. It's pretty fucked up when you think about it. Yeah. It's thought that Gary had been going to Chase for research and inside information about what happened in Panama. So... Alford, uh, Dr. Matthew Alford, also discovered evidence of Gary working at Tanopa Air Force Base. So Gary was working on a film called Stealth at the time, which he later abandoned in the early 90s when he was visiting the military base. Um, so area, or, um, the military base is actually sometimes known as um, uh, Area 52, which is kind of weird. Um, it housed the F-117 Nighthawk, this stealth attack aircraft that was used in the Gulf War as well as, as, well as many others. Um, and this brings in the question of Gary's security clearance. Like, not anybody can just get into that Air Force base. Mm -hmm. So both Wendy, um, both Wendy Gary's widow and ex-wife Claudia Christian commented on strange events that they had experienced with Gary. Wendy talked about how she once saw strange symbols on his computer and Gary explained them as encryption codes. Uh, Claudia Christian said, quote, I recall when we were married, I walked into his office unannounced and saw what appeared to be, I don't know how to say this, Cyrillic? Yeah, Cyrillic. Cyrillic writing on his computer. He was furious at me for disturbing him, end quote. So, Dr. Matthew Alford, he really looks into the government conspiracy side of this case. Um, the Bones mishap was actually was what revealed by, by him. Um, he also talks about, and many other people talk about, the, how there was an unmarked black helicopter scene hovering above um, the area where his car was discovered, like when it was happening. Um, Mike Burridge, the public information officer for the Santa Barbara Sheriff's Department, recalls the incident, saying that he, re he like, remembers seeing someone taking pictures and that actually it was, like, re it, the helicopter was flying really low. Quote, as soon as he put the camera back on the tripod and panned down that way and began to record, the helicopter took off. He, the cameraman, told me, when he looked at it, it didn't have any markings. There was no tail number, no end number. Everybody inside the helicopter was wearing dark clothing. It was completely black. I could see the majority that I could see the majority of that with my naked eye. It was that close. That obviously raised suspicions about who was in that aircraft. End quote. The next day, Mike Burridge received an unsolicited phone call from a man named Anderson. Um, claiming to be a public information officer from the Air Force. And this Anderson guy explained that they had been receiving lots of radio interference in that area and they had sent a crew to go check it out. So that's why that helicopter was there. You don't need to worry about it. It's fine. Um, after, that, after the phone number that Anderson provided didn't check out, Burridge, uh, Burridge went to the Air Force Public Affairs office and talk to them about it, and they were unable to identify identify any Anderson, and that um, they couldn't really figure out what he was talking about. Mm. Um, this story that was corroborated by Wendy and her friends, Burridge also explains how days after the disappearance, um, Chase Brandon showed up at Wendy's house and went into Gary's office when, and so when a friend of Wendy's had gone into the room to find a sweater, she saw Brendan, she like sees, um, Chase Brandon bent over Gary's computer. And when, uh, Wendy checked the computer shortly afterwards, she found that it had been frozen and completely unusable and they'd throw it out. Um, Burge decided to get in contact with Chase Brandon himself to see like, okay, like what's going on here? But he had no luck. Um, he was literally ignoring phone calls, letters, everything. 
So Burridge got in touch with the FBI. He was like, hey, can you look into this for me? And they agreed to interview uh, Chase Brandon about what happened at Wendy's home. Um, but the only report Burge got back from the FBI investigators who went to interview Brandon was that, quote, there was no need to follow up on this avenue of inquiry, end quote. <laughs> well, how lucky for everyone involved. Yeah. <laughs> so let's touch on more about the big steal and the U.S. invasion of, of Panama. So the final script was set to reveal secrets of the Panama invasion and the real reason for the war. So it was supposed to paint a picture, and these are all um, based on earlier copies of, of scripts and what people who were working with Gary said. Sure. So uh, there could be some mix up here. Um, so it was supposed to paint a picture of a country devastated uh, by the U.S. military while U.S. Army intelli intelligence plans and organizes the theft of Manuel Noriega's drug money. Um, the script had been full of skeptic skepticism. It had lines like, quote, it sounds like the Pentagon planned the bank robbery and the war is just a diversion, end quote. An early draft that was obtained also had lines like, quote, starting a war you can't lose is good for morale, end quote. So there was some pretty deep burns in there. So really, we don't know what ever really happened to Gary DeVore. The questions that remain is that if there is any truth to the evidence found by Dr. Alford, um, Dr. Matthew Alford, as well as the comments from Wendy's wife, or um, from... His wife, Wendy. His wife, Wendy. It says Wendy's <laughs> wife. His wife, Wendy, will never know why Gary DeVore disappeared. That is, if he was even, like, purposely disappeared in the first place. And another question is, how close was Gary to the CIA and, and the agency in general? Um, Gary was actually the best man at Tommy Lee Jones's wedding in 1981, and Chase Brandon is Tommy Lee Jones's cousin. Hmm. So they've had a relationship for a long time. They've known each other for a long time. Yeah. So the question then is, was Gary one of Chase Brandon's recruits? Um, w one of the things that was part of his job and this would this could be a whole other topic we could talk about like the cia's influence in the media and shit like that but he would like um throw out ideas about stuff and i remember reading about uh, something about um him pitching an idea about like a predator plane and attack or something and then like a couple weeks later that attack happened in real life and like shit like that it was crazy so also, how did he even end up in the aqueduct? Like, where, where are his missing laptop and handgun? And not to mention, where are his hands? Um, what's with the bones? Why was that allegedly fake? Um, why didn't Wendy ever get results from that second autopsy? What's going on there? Um, and Dr. Alford, so I like, I like that the Vice article brings this up. And challenges this. He says, so Dr. Alford, Alford studied this case for a long, long time. And in the Vice article, he gives out a lot of crazy theories. He's like sure that the last part of Divorce Film was going to be like a big reveal of confidential government secrets. And he also, quote, focuses on claims made in British newspaper The Correspondent in 1989 that Noriega had run a honey trap for U.S. officials. Dr. Alfred suggests that divorce film may have presented the invasion as nothing more than a diversion that would allow the U.S. into Panama to, ste to steal back incriminating photos of senior U.S. officials that Noriega could have used as blackmail, end quote. What does that face say? What? You're like, oh, yeah. <laughs> no, I'm just that that's a good plot for a movie. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I don't know whether it's true or not. Yeah. But, you know. Um, yeah, and so what I liked about the Vice article is that they really kind of challenged this, and they highlighted a review of the document of the documentary, The Writer With No Hands, um, from a uh, the POV magazine uh, stating, quote, while Gary's death raises essential questions about the propaganda machine, the figurative disappearance of Matthew Alfred reveals the perils of all-consuming intellectualism. Only Hollywood escapism makes one believe that one can catch, catch a fish that isn't even there, end quote. Um, and Alfred also acknowledges this. He's like, 
yeah, like I, I mean, yes, my passion could definitely be thought of as an obsession. Like he doesn't, he's not like in denial about that. He's like, yes, he, he recognizes this is something that has deeply affected his personal life, um, in, in general. But then there's the motive. Would the CIA really murder someone over a movie? Um, however, this was a time, like I talked about before, when the CIA had a huge presence in Hollywood, and so maybe they thought this could have caused some kind of political shift. I will say that the CIA generally assassinates people in other countries. I've not heard of... I don't know if I've heard of an instance where it's known that they assassinated someone within the United States. Well, there was a... Oh, I don't know if I still have it up. I don't think I have it up. I'm not saying it's never happened. I'm just saying that's sort of a totally different thing. Well, there was a different... um, alleged cia official who like talked to wendy and like uh, and and offered a theory that was like yo like you know i think he we we don't kill our own okay so this is and then he throws out like russian like drug cartel and stuff like that sure yeah and who knows i mean that could just be throwing sand but i mean other countries have assassinated Americans and other nationals on American soil. So it's not like that's never happened. Right. That's happened many times. Right. Um, What we do know is that the official version of the events are weird and they definitely don't reflect what Gary's friends and families think. And that is the death of Gary DeVore. My sources. Very mysterious. Very very mysterious. mysterious. Um, My sources Hollywood Hitmen, The Gary DeVore Murder Conspiracy by Matthew (laughs) Alford and Robbie Graham from the 14 Times. Um, A Vice article by Thomas Gain and uh, um, Gary DeVore's Wikipedia page had a little bit, not much. I usually went to it for the references like I usually do with Wikipedia. Their sources are better than. sometimes (laughs) sometimes <laughs> the summary itself it varies it varies okay okay what's next tell me all about it tell me about it um i'm gonna do a classic murdery uh story this week and it's um the uh unsolved serial killer known as the denver strangler now apparently i didn't really realize this until i was looking at some other sort of resources that I didn't even list because I didn't really even read the whole thing. But anyway, apparently there's a more modern Denver Strangler, so maybe you want to call this the original Denver Strangler, I guess, if you want. Now, the Denver Strangler also goes by Jack the Strangler, the Market Street Strangler, or simply the Strangler. So, whatever you want. If you're in, you know, a house on Market Street in 1894, you're just going to call him the, the Strangler, right? Because it's the the guy who's going around strangling all these women, as we'll, as we'll kind of get into. The Bikini Bottom Strangler! <laughs> exactly like that. Um, the, presumably, of course, the same person, as with any unsolved serial killer, of course, we don't actually really know, but um, that's sort of the whole point, right? But, um... There is every indication that at least three and maybe s- several more women were killed by this person uh, between 1894 and 1903 okay. um, in and around uh, Denver and, and maybe some other places as well. Um, but let's begin with the first three victims, all women living in the same little part of the neighborhood um, on, on Market Street in, in Denver um, here at the uh, end, end of the 19th century. So first was Lena Tapper. Uh, Lena had moved from Minnesota, previously living in the towns of Fulda and Heron Lake, before moving to Denver, um, which was then kind of a French colony, really. It was more French than American, it seems like, or at least partly, um, with a man named Richard Demity, to whom we'll get back later. Um, Now, Lena was a sex worker, or, as the Worthington Advance uh, put it, quote, Mrs. Tapper had the reputation of being somewhat unchaste, close quote. Uh, so she was a little bit unchaste, but that's that's okay. Um, <laughs> right. Anyway. And uh, both she and Richard Demity were reportedly part of this secret French society called uh, Macaron, or um, Le Cavalier d'Amour. Okay. Yeah. 
So super super cool. Um, I guess I don't know. Which uh, don't I don't really know much about it. It seems to be very mysterious. Um, I I could find very little information about it um, on the interwebs. Damn. Maybe that's just because it's not very important, or maybe it's because it's very mysterious. So we'll lie. Uh, it's very important. Uh, perhaps it's that it, it's a mystery. Um, but apparently, um, uh, Lena and Richard. Um, and these other Mecro people may or may not have been getting up to some pretty shady shit around Denver around the 19 in uh. the 19th century. So that's it's there. It may maybe allegedly allegedly. Uh, in any case, uh, Lena met her untimely end, unfortunately, on September 3rd of 1894, and this was the first gruesome murder in this seamy corner of uh, Denver that that would come to you know haunt them. Um, it was determined that Lena died by choking, uh, strangulation, and she was found laying on her bed, uh, lying on her bed. Um, this would come to mark the, the modus operandi of a series of ghastly murders that would come to, as I said, haunt the area um, around Market Street over the course of the next decade. So, second victim, Marie Cantassois. Or however you actually say that. Kind of I am not entirely sure. Um, Marie was also, quote unquote, somewhat unchaste, and uh, like Lena, was also tied to the mackerel. Um, she okay. was shacking up with this guy named Tony Sanders, uh, to whom we'll get back later. Oh, I think you can you can see where I'm going, right? Yes. So some of these people will be in the list of suspects. So that's what I'm hinting at here. Um, Marie became the Denver Strangler's second victim. Uh, and her body was found on October 28th. Um, just like Lena, she was found strangled and lying in her bed. And this is how the morning call described the state of the neighborhood after this second grisly murder was discovered. Quote, the occupants of a house on Market Street are in a state bordering on panic in consequence of the belief that they are in danger at the hands of a supposed strangler. Close quote. Um, yes, they are in a panic. Um, five men were arrested after the discovery of Marie's body, and these did include Richard Demity, the lover of the first victim, Lena, who had, quote-unquote, recently made overtures, again, according to the morning call, um, to the second victim, Marie. So he's he, living with the first victim, was sort of flirting with the second victim, so uh, yeah, clearly there's going to be a lot of suspicion around this Demity character. Is that um, what recently made overtures means? In in uh, eighteen ninety four speak, when you're writing it in the paper, yes, that's like uh, maybe they were you know doing it on the down low, perhaps. <laughs> Who knows, right? <laughs> that's not how people talked at any time ever. <laughs> By the way, um, so Marie's, um, uh, uh, some of the other suspects that were arrested, Marie's last boyfriend, Charlie Shutton, uh, John Callahan, a guy who had reportedly claimed to have, um, been robbed, um, it, when he was in Marie's house, like a, the week before or something of $170, which was a lot of money, um, at that time in that place. So, um, he was also arrested and he was also allegedly seen in the area the night of the crime. Mm. Two other uh. men. Sorry? I was just saying there's a lot of potential... Oh, yes. There are lots of... of I'm not going to talk about all the suspects, because there's just way too many, and some of them don't even matter enough to talk about. Yeah. <laughs> so two other men who were in the house uh, the night of the murder were also arrested but quickly released due to lack of evidence. And these were Antonio Santo Pietro, a recently laid-off messenger for the police department, and Emile Tamins, okay. uh, who was Marie's cook. And Emile was apparently super jealous of Antonio because Marie liked Antonio, but Emile liked Marie. And I'm not too sure, but I'm fairly certain that Antonio didn't like Marie back. What kind of so there's a whole grassy bullshit is this? Whole thing going on there that I am not gonna <laughs> get Rom too far com. into. Rom com. <laughs> Could have a whole movie just about their relationship. Murdery rom com. Right? So uh, none of the other people in the house the night of the murder um, reportedly heard anything. Um, they all claimed that they didn't know anything had happened until the body was discovered the next day. The third victim uh, was named Kiku Oyama, and uh, Kiku was uh, Japanese. Um, she had come to America, kind of saw the ex big expedition in Chicago, and fell in love with it and decided to, to stay. Um, Kiku was um, 
perhaps also unchaste. Um, definitely friends with a lot of unchaste women. Um, soon before her murder, Kiku um, kind of had this little, I don't know, adventure, you might say. I don't know. Um, where she had bailed out a bunch of women who had gotten caught up in a raid on the nice. sort of red light district there a in bad Denver, bitch. right? Um, so she, along with her sort of boyfriend, Imi Oyama, another cook, and, um, sorry, it's just two other people. I realized how that sounded when I said it. Imi Oyama, who was also a cook, okay. and a French saloon keeper went to go bail these women out. Now, the, the saloon keeper was there because he had money. So he fronted the money, and they sort of, you know, convinced him to do this. And later, he demanded not only his money back, but also an extra $33 which was a lot of money. And uh, Kiko was not happy about this. And they had a reportedly a loud argument about it. And um, at least some of the people, you know, thought maybe this had something to do with what happened. But uh, the saloon keeper never came back anywhere else that I read anything. So I really have no hmm. idea. There's another suspect. Sure. Why not? throw another one out. Just a lot Don't of, even know his name. Like you said earlier, a lot of shady shit going on. L oh, there was a shit ton of shady shit going on around <laughs> Denver at this time, apparently. A shit ton of shady shit. There was, like, something in one of the... Our, I read a bunch of old-timey news articles remember, for this, by the way. I remember you read ones there were, like, gossip columns and stuff. Oh, yeah, like, just so much. <laughs> it was like came back from It was Facebook today. in the paper. It was crazy. I didn't know that ever existed, but... Um, no, yeah, one of the writers, they said, like, the two uh, most infamous uh, towns in all the world, Amsterdam and Denver. And that was like, I don't know, <laughs> but okay. I guess at that time, Denver was <laughs> real, real seedy. Um, so, to get back to the story, Kiku was last seen alive on the evening of November 13th, 1894. Um, what apparently happened was she was a uh, visiting friend whom she left at 10 p.m. saying that she was going to go to sleep, and then she went back to her house and drew the curtains, right? Presumably went to sleep. Um, her boyfriend, Emi, took one of his um, long late-night walks that he was wont to take. Not sure what that means, but uh, whatever he was doing, he was doing it uh, until about 3 a.m. Oh, oh. Um, when he came back, and at that point, he found Kiku... Not quite dead. She was strangled. Like the other victims, she had been at least partially strangled by a, a towel used as a kind of, you know, garrote, right? And the towel was still tightly bound mm -hmm. around her neck, but she was still breathing slightly when he came in. And like the other victims, she was l lying on the bed. And um, apparently, although... You know, Emi swiftly intervened. Um, she died soon thereafter, like moments afterwards, oh my God. and um, did not reveal her killer or say anything per se. She probably couldn't say anything. It would it would seem not um, that that she was almost literally in her last gasp of breath in life. Um, Emi ran to go get help, um, which aroused the attention of a nearby policeman named Carberry, who went in and witnessed the you know, Same. just dead Kiku, yeah. Um, he also saw signs of a violent struggle um, that seems to have occurred prior to her killing. And finger marks were clearly visible where Kiku had been strangled, as well as, apparently, um, with, the, with the towel. She also had a superficial uh, bruise on her forehead. But they said yeah. her, her skull wasn't fractured so or there anything. There was something. So, yeah, clearly there was some kind of fracas before her actual murderer. Um, so, a little assessment on the mood of Market Street at this point, right? Another murder in the past three months has occurred, right? In this little, you know, this street, just one street, literally just doors down from one another. I mean, that's how crazy this is, right? If you're living in this area. Um, so anyway, this is from the, uh, the morning news, um, from November 18th of 1894, quote, The quarter where the three stranglings occurred is today in a condition of absolute fear, the women being in terror of the fulfillment of the prediction of a clairvoyant, that within three days more, another woman shall be strangled by the same hand. Close quote. Ooh. The clairvoyant will also come back later. Ooh, 
of scary Victorian. Ooh. Yes, Victorian people were super into clairvoyance, including like multiple Absolutely. wives of presidents, etc. <laughs> uh, I mean, people still are, but it was really a thing back then. Um, the assumed motive for it at least these first three murder murders seems to have been robbery as each of the victims was also robbed. Um, so it, it doesn't seem necessarily that this was, uh, I don't know what, what do you want? What do you want to say? Uh, a serial killer who's doing it for fun. I don't know. This, the I serial mean, killing may or may not have been the, the sole focus of the murders. Fun is such I don't a know. subjective word from the perspective of the murderer. Of course, <laughs> not condoning murder sorry um so For shits and giggles or what they they have a pathology that causes them to misapprehend that this kind of thing is enjoyable that's what i'm trying to say um but if in fact the so-called denver strangler is also responsible for some later killings right in ohio and new york then perhaps it is a more i don't know bona fide serial killer what we think of conceive of as a serial killer typically um, so one later suspected victim killed in 1898, so about four years later, um, was named Julia Vaught. And Julia was, in fact, that clairvoyant and medium that was mentioned in that news article. Um, when all of, you know, the, the killings were occurring, Julia had offered her services to the police, you know, doing her civic duty. Um, I'm, I'm a medium, you know, I can talk to the dead, let me ask okay. the victims, things like that. I don't believe in it, but hey. On October 7th, 1898, Julia was found dead herself in her apartment. Oh, shit. I wonder... Hmm. She was killed in a very similar manner to the other victims. The only dif key difference being that she was found on the floor, not lying on her bed. Maybe she put up a fight. That could, could have been. I mean, you know? also with these things, this, the details are so scant. You know, it's so yeah. it's hard to make determinations. But um, police did suspect, apparently, that the killer either genuinely was afraid that Julia, you know, knew something, um, whether supernaturally or not, or they just felt like they couldn't take the chance, right? Better just to silence her. Um, although it, the four-year, you know, time lapse is a little hard to explain, but, you know, who knows? The last um, suspected victim was killed in 1903, um, so about, again, nine years later, and uh, she was Mabel Brown, and uh, her killing also, you know, um, it, it, would, it just mainly fit the M.O., like, perfectly. That's why people think it was. Um, the same it was killer. three years later? Nine years after oh, the initial killings. Um, she oh, was wow. strangled um, with visible marks on her throat, and she was also lying, lying on her bed, mm -hmm. and the papers, you know, con connected them for sure. And it was in the same Denver area? Right, and it was in that same, you know, area on Market Street in Denver. Do they think it was somebody local then? There's, I mean, who knows, right? But, yeah, I mean, the main suspects lived in Denver. But, yeah, I was actually going to kind of get to the, to the oh, suspects, okay. yeah. Um, so, um, first one I'll talk about was named Victor Monchereau. Uh Victor reportedly had very large hands. Um, so this would not have been difficult for him, per se. Mm, um, he was accused in a drunken rant by a man named Alphonse Lamar, um, who I'll get much more into here in a second, um, specifically of the killing of Marie Cantusso, uh, the second victim, but also others, but that one, like, specifically. Um, after being arrested, Victor Monchereau implicated Alphonse Lamar. So they were accusing each other, like, at the same time. Like, the police were in this room That's interrogating he one. Said, and she said, she said, Literally, that, yeah. yeah. He said, he said, kind of stuff said, went on said, here. They said, um, all said. And apparently these were not, like, the most upstanding people in the world. So, <laughs> um, just in general, um, the, the, the suspects. Um, so Alphonse Lamar, um, to whom I, you know, just referred, um, was implicated by Victor Monchereau, it, you know, um, yes, that back. And according to, um, the evening world, um, oh, but, but let me, let me talk about Alphonse Lamar. Sorry, it gets so fucking complicated. I'm going to give a description from a newspaper of Alphonse Lamar accusing Victor Monchereau. Okay. 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 So this is from the evening world. And, um, here's what he said, according to the paper, quote, I know who killed that woman announced Lamar. <laughs> I know the man. 
Lamar brought his fist down on the table with terrific force as he said the words. It was Victor who did it. It was Victor. It was Victor. It was Victor. <laughs> Victor. Um, stuff like that. He uh, stole the cookie from the cookie jar. <laughs> oh my god, I shouldn't do that. Um, according to <laughs> Alphonse Lamar, Victor was under the impression that Marie had been given a large sum of money to hold in her house by a there friend it is. Money, and killed money. her during the robbery. So. Again, yes, keying into what we already suspected was robbery was the motive. Alphonse went on to explain... Went on to explain! Um, right. That, <laughs> right. That Victor found only $68, very disappointingly, when he searched Marie's home. Allegedly. He vehemently denounced Victor, whom he claimed to have met while they were both serving time in San Quentin... After being arrested on suspicion of himself being the strangler, Alphonse confessed that he was approached by Victor to do the job, but refused, and Victor did it himself. Victor allegedly also confessed to killing other women by strangulation and that he intended to kill more. Close quote. So is Victor full of shit or what? It, one or both of them are full of shit. It's, <laughs> that much seems clear. And it seems it like they're getting a lot not. of attention. Yes. You know? Yes, and other people have pointed that out, too. Really? That yeah. That maybe this is all kind of a smoke screen for et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So, um, so implicating um, either Alphonse or Victor or both was the testimony of another man named um, J.W. Williams. And he claimed to police to have overheard um, Alphonse and Victor talking on the street as he was, like, walking behind them. And um, what he says is that one of them said, quote, I did it. And he heard them kind of talking about the murders, and then he heard, I did but he didn't know which one it was. I don't know. It's all very mysterious. Lots of hearsay. Tons Lots of, of hearsay. Finger-pointing. Yes. Um, next suspect uh, was named Tony Sanders, and Tony Sanders was, of course... You talked about him earlier? Right, yeah. the lover of Man Marie kind of so okay. the second victim. Um, he was only briefly suspected. He was... Um, uh, he followed the case very closely. He, he attempted to help the police, mm -hmm. right? Which we know now can be a red, sometimes, red yeah. flag sometimes. Um, he also kind of orchestrated that drunken rant by Alphonse. Um, so what happened was Alphonse came in half drunk to the bar where Tony Sanders happened to be. And um, Alphonse Lamar just like sat there sullenly watching these guys play pool. And um, he overheard, Alphonse overheard Tony Sanders talking about the case. And that's when he was like, I know who killed him. <laughs> and thus we start the story. I know who killed him. I know who killed him. <laughs> I'm really messing up my voice. Okay, I need to stop. Um, now, we talked about possible smokescreen earlier, right? Okay, who would be orchestrating this alleged smokescreen, right? None other than the mackerel, like Cavalier de Amour, oh, that, we've, that we've mentioned so many group? times. Right, yeah, the whole secret so... French society. Because who, who knows? And apparently those guys may have had ties to them too. So another sort of like meta theory I think you can make. I didn't really explicitly read this, I think, but it, or maybe I did, I can't remember, even fucking remember, but is that they were orchestrating these robberies um, and just, you know, using the, the sensational killings as a smokescreen and then sending these guys out to accuse one another so the police didn't know what to do. That's big. You know, which is kind of what happened. I mean, a, a little bit. Um... Now, the main, main suspect, of course, is that we'll finally get back to here is Richard Demity, um, the one who kind of makes the most sense, right? So, um, like I said earlier, he was definitely, you know, probably the main suspect, and he definitely had the means and opportunity since he lived with one of the victims, consorted with another one of the victims. Uh, every indication was that he was capable physically of the crimes, um, and his motive, you know, may simply have been robbery. Or maybe something else. I don't know. It's it's hard to speculate, right? Now, a weird side story here that makes it all just that much creepier is that the police went to Demity's sister, who had apparently had a nervous breakdown, complete nervous breakdown, after her, her brother's um, arrest. Hmm. Um, and, and the police went to her to see if they could get any, glean any information from her, uh, rantings and ravings, which apparently is what she was mainly doing. That's what they say all women did. Right, but this time for real. Um, 
No, but sh- but you're right. It is sign of the times. Sign of the times. Um, those late nineteenth century times. Um, she, um, Demity's sister, claimed that at times she could see the ghosts of her brother's victims, and that they haunted and tormented her. And that's what drove her insane. Apparently, was was those um, well, would one I would I guess assume would be visual hallucinations, not in fact the the ghosts, but I mean, really, who knows, right? Um, and here's a quote about it from the San Francisco Call: "Quote at times she would stand for hours, her hands grasping the bars of her room." and her long, golden hair streaming almost to the floor, silent. And then she would often break out in denunciations of Demody's accusers and talk of the crimes. Close quote. Was she, did she say details that the public didn't know? No. There's, I didn't, apparently they didn't get any information from her that was useful. But apparently officers spent hours with her trying to get information. Probably not being super helpful or nice to her. That's what I would imagine. Um, And she was imprisoned, again, sign of the times, in the county hospital as a consequence of her mental breakdown. Um, She wasn't given treatment, per se, um, is what it seems. So, um, yes, in the end, Richard Demity went on trial. From what I could find, he was the only one that ever went on trial for any of these murders, and it was only for Lena Tapper's murder. Um, And he was acquitted. Okay, okay, so it wasn't like a... um what? Uh, f- um, Hung jury? Is that what you're trying to think? No. Of? So he wasn't accused for being a serial killer. No, he was. was he was only for- on trial for Lena Tapper's murder. Okay. Um, and and he was acquitted. Um, after about four and a half hours of deliberation, and that that's not unusual as far as I can recall of different cases. I mean, usually the the police will go after the one case or two cases where they have the best evidence, right? The best case to make. And if there are other murders, well, hey, we're going to send him away for life anyway. Maybe he did it, maybe he didn't. Right, but what's the use in pursuing this case that we think we might lose? Again, this is from the prosecutor's perspective, right? Anyway, um, and after Richard Demity was freed, he did move to Brazil, for whatever that's worth. Uh, He left the country soon after, so who knows? Um... There, like I said before, are like a bunch of other suspects uh, that I'm definitely not going to get into. (laughs) But I did want to mention the one wild and wacky theory, of course, that has to always come up. That um, because it is technically possible um, that the Denver Strangler may, in fact, be Jack the Ripper, Jack the Strangler, Jack the Ripper, and of course, just to throw it in for a little more spice, could technically also have been the Servant Girl Annihilator. They could all have been the same person. It is technically not impossible. So that's my story for this week. Yay! Great. It's freaky when it all comes together like that. It's what? Like I mean, freaky can, Wednesday. Can you imagine if the Servant Girl and Alan and Jack the Ripper were like all the same? I think I, I remember like looking at it. It's like they were all within a lifetime of each other. Yeah. I think that's all you really need. And in the 19th century, you, I mean, you could get from Denver to Austin to London pretty easily. You could? Like, sure. I mean, it would take you maybe like six months or a year or two years or five years. Yeah, you but could hop on a it's boat. It's like and not that hard. See you ya. Know? It's not like it's 5,000 BC. I don't know. It's not like you have a social security number or some shit, you exactly. know? Exactly. Just call yourself H.H. H. Holmes, you know, set yourself up as a legitimate businessman and start wholesale murdering people God and th- throwing their bodies through fucking trap doors. You could do it. Um, Broken mattresses. <laughs> right. Gas rooms. We Going could, through the, a shoot. The crazy thing is we could never talk about H.H. H. Holmes, though, because it's just not a mystery. But it is super interesting and That's terrible. fucked up. And really, really fucked up. Well, do we know for sure how many people he killed? I don't know. Anyway, who cares? So, I know, right? Fuck you, right? Who fucking does bullshit. I'm sorry. I shouldn't. <laughs> I shouldn't get on that. That makes okay. me angry. Yeah, <laughs> anger. So my flames my, in the side of my face. Flames coming, coming out of my face. <laughs> Love you, Mandel- Mandel- Khan. 
um, Wikipedia, I'm just going to say my sources now, Wikipedia, the Denver Strangler page, and a bunch of different newspapers. So, The Sun, The Worthington Advance, The Morning Call, The Evening World, The Evening Star, The San Francisco Call, Vermont Phoenix, The Wilmington Daily Republican, Spokane Press, Omaha Daily Bee, The Morning News, The Salt Lake Herald, The Herald, St. Paul Globe, The Morning News, Washington Bee, and Fort Worth Gazette. Okay. Oh, yeah, that was all so many, like... If you go to the Denver... Microfiche. I mean, it was microfiche, but it was well, yeah, zooming at this in point, on, yeah. like, tiny articles. But, yeah, if you go to the Wikipedia article for Denver Strangler, they have links to 25 different news pages from the 19th century. It's actually pretty fun to look at if you're a super nerd. Super I mean, I'm not a super nerd because those people are actually doing meaningful things with their lives with their nerdery, but I like to think of myself as a nerd. Okay, you got any weird shit in the news? I do have some weird shit in the news. So let's take a look here. Okay. This is what we're gonna do. title, this is from the OCR. OCR. The Orange County Register. Oh. I was like, the fuck? (laughs) So I've got some Disneyland Paris news. Um, The title is... Disneyland Paris visitor on bad LSD trip falls into Adventureland Lake, turns up naked after 130 person search. Jesus Christ. So, and it's funny because he's okay. Okay, everybody, he's fine. But will we ever be will okay? Will we be okay? Again? Um, so, the 32 year old man was reported missing Friday night. This was on the 23rd. Just kind of petered out there, didn't you? 23rd. 23rd. <laughs> Two days ago. Um, so this past Friday night, he was reported missing by his 30-year-old girlfriend. And so she tells police, she's like, yeah, my boyfriend fell into the Adventureland Lake. And he didn't, like, come back after. And so this was after she, like, they popped some LSD together. Um, so... She, you know, talks to the theme park officials, and there's a search party. There was 30 firefighters, 10 divers, 10 policemen, 80 Disneyland Paris employees, and a police helicopter with thermal imaging cameras. So, uh, yeah. Wow. And, um... He was found on the bank of the lake at 12.30 a.m. Saturday morning, um... So there was a follow-up story, uh, and so, like, he was found naked about a mile from the theme park. Quote, he was walking in the middle of the road. He did not have a centimeter of cloth on him, and he walked barefoot. End quote. The shock driver who found the Swiss man told Le Parisien, translated from French, quote, I stopped, got out of the car, and went to meet him. End quote. (laughs) Yeah, so that guy, like, took him to his house, gave him some clothes, and drove him back to, like, the park. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Um, nice guy. But uh, they were detained for narcotics use, but then, you know, they were on their way by <laughs> right <laughs> Saturday afternoon. And he's got a crazy story. Oh, Jesus. My uh, weird shit is, um, well, it's, it's not that weird. It's more just like interesting and kind of nice. But anyway, it's all I could find. And it's from the Reuters, oddly enough, page uh, that I love so much. Mm-hmm. And it's qu- uh, from uh, George Sargent. And it's uh, titled, From Tree to Chair Without Carpentry, UK Couple Grows Furniture. So, apparently this is a thing uh, that one can do. And apparently people have been doing it for thousands of years. Um, sort of like an, an ancient kind of Makes thing. Makes sense. And you yeah. So uh, there is a, a sort of technique by which one can um, cajole, you know, a, a growing sapling into a certain form, and that form could be a chair or a table or a lamp. And these how people, do you move it? Well, very subtly, apparently. Um, so you you know you tie it, you know, tie it, or you know, kind of. Um, you know, put something there to obstruct it. But they they said the first crop that they tried to do, well, a lot of it got trampled and, and like, destroyed by animals and stuff, but some of them also didn't work because they were trying to, like, force it away from where it was trying to grow rather than, like, shaping it around the direction it's trying to grow. Oh, so apparently it's... complicated. Yeah. Do you have to water it? Is it supposed oh, to yeah. be for indoor use? Well, you grow the so tree into the shape and then you harvest the tree. So it takes years and years and years. 
They said it takes like five, nine years or something. I can't remember for you to get like a chair or something. So they have pre-orders out to like 2030. And they also these things that's cost nice, like thousands and thousands. That's a nice of gift that you like forget about. You're like, oh, right. My my tree chair. But you know, to them it's like, well, the the guy who it was his main idea, he like he and his wife do it together. Um, I guess he had like a like a spinal deformity mm-hmm. um, when he was growing up, and and the you know doctors and stuff helped him to correct it, and that kind of inspired him. And and um, I guess he also like heard about this thing that you could do this, and just felt like, hey, this is my calling. Like this is what I'm going to do with the, like the rest of my life is like be a champion for this. I love that. And it's like you know from his perspective, it's it's like more sustainable. It doesn't involve. You know, all these, like, machines and everything. And True. It is an environmentally friendly yeah. tactic. So, you know, sustainability, which is always good. So, um, yeah, I think that's uh, about it. Thanks for listening. Thank you so much for um, listening. And we'll see you. Like we said, you know, we are, uh, you know, just going every other week. So don't yes. expect it every Wednesday, but every other Wednesday. Every other Wednesday. And we'll t- hold ourselves to doing more research to justify that. I'm very excited. <laughs> yes. To start this process. Yes. Uh, we can we can watch more documentaries. And, yeah, it's just going to be good. So, um, yeah. Thanks for listening. Hit up, yeah. hit up our Hit us up Insta. on all the social medias, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. I've been, I've been doing a lot of tweeting. Um, tweetering, sorry. Because, you know, uh, other you things are right happening thing in the world. And then, like, corrected yourself to the wrong thing because you're trying you know, to be charming. Gotta be idiomatic. I think you're charming. In your own particular idiom, idiom, sir. Um, sorry, r- random Monty Python reference. <laughs> uh, so, that happens with you a lot. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's not a complaint. <laughs> Um, so yeah. yeah, Mario text 30. That's my tweeter. So have a good bye. Okay, <laughs> or whatever. Bye.